Today, we're hanging out with the experts at Print Lab Chicago. Hey there and welcome to Flurn. My name is Aaron Nace. You can find me on flurn.com where we make learning fun. I'm so excited. We're answering your six most asked printing questions and we have a legitimate professional. This is Xander Fisher. You are a print technician and this is this is what you do. It's what I do. This is you. This is me. I've got all kinds of questions. I know there are a lot of myths flowing out there and printing is super, super difficult. I think printing isn't as difficult as you think it is when you come to Print Lab. Oh, let's get into it. So one of the biggest questions we get is that my print doesn't look anything like it did on my computer. What can we do about that, Xander? Uh, well, I'd say the number one thing is the brightness. So you're dealing with a backlit view of your image on a screen. When you're dealing with prints, they're front lit. So people have the brightness cranked up on their screen. It looks bright and saturated and beautiful, but like a piece of paper just doesn't inherently look like that. Right. You know, one of the things that you need to consider is how is this print being viewed? If you know like, hey, this is gonna be displayed in my basement or in my hallway or something like that, we could proof your print under different lighting circumstances because the color is also going to change. Let's say I'm gonna make a print and I want it to look right. Should I just brighten it up in Photoshop, like in general? I'd say um, erring on the brighter side is a safe bet. I always tell people, you know, if you don't have a dedicated print monitor, you'll be looking at your image in sRGB and the monitor is generally way too bright. Decreasing the brightness on your monitor, maybe decreasing the contrast a little bit, and just in general brightening up your image but making sure you're not clipping is a, a good starting point. So when it comes to brightening things up in Photoshop, are we talking about curves, adjustment layers, which Flurn viewers have probably seen me use before. Is that a good tool? Yeah, I would say curves are the number one tool that I'd recommend. Are you generally grabbing like towards the middle of the curves line or? It kind of depends on what paper you're printing on. With matte papers, you're probably going to want to brighten up the shadows a little bit more. And I would do that in Camera Raw if you can. Okay. Um, and I know you talk about smart object workflows. I'd really recommend that besides curves, but both work really well. Okay, fantastic. Now, as far as screens are concerned, what's the deal with monitor calibration? Is this important? Should we be doing it? Does it actually make a difference? Um, well, so I think a big misconception about monitor calibration is that uh, it is the end all solution. A problem is that if you don't have a dedicated print monitor, your monitor is not really gonna calibrate very well. Monitor calibration can often do more harm than good. Oh, interesting, okay. Um, unless you have a dedicated print monitor, I'd say that those tips about just making your monitor darker and making your monitor maybe a little less contrasty are probably going to do just as well of an approximation for print. So, I mean, Apple displays are great, and for what you're doing, you know, a big portion of your audience is looking at it on that kind of display. If your intention is to go to print, a print monitor is going to replicate that paper a lot closer with the appropriate calibration settings. So a few print monitors I'd recommend would be EIZO, E-I-Z-O, okay. um, and the CG series monitors are sort of the top tier. If I decided I'm gonna get really into printing, I wanna print at home, I wanna do this myself, a dedicated monitor might make sense. But if I'm just gonna be sending my work to you guys, which is exactly what I do, and it probably doesn't make sense for me to get a dedicated print monitor. Giving us a file with full data in it, you know, sending a 16-bit TIFF, Adobe RGB, just air on the side of Brighter, we'll take care of the rest. Okay, it's basically just commercial for you guys. So the next big one, and I've heard this uh, thrown around ever since I was in university, is CMYK versus RGB. I've heard it said, if you're gonna get something printed, you gotta put it in CMYK, because that's what printers read. What's the deal with this? Is that true? Should I be sending it to you in CMYK or RGB? 
Please don't send us CMYK files. CMYK color spaces are much smaller than RGB spaces. So even printing in sRGB is going to be a larger color space than CMYK profiles. That's crazy. So CMYK color space is really just if you're going to an offset press, a generally very large machine that runs the cyan, then the yellow, then the magenta, then the black. But you're not printing like that. If you're getting fine art prints made, you are using an inkjet printer, which prints all the colors at once on a print head that is an amazingly complex piece of equipment. Pretty much all of us have inkjet printers. You just have like really nice inkjet printers. Yeah. So the printer wants to get Adobe RGB 1998. Is that a good color space? That is a good color space. The other thing I will caution against is please do not use Profoto color space. The pro photo gamut is huge. I mean, it's so large that there are colors in it that go beyond the visible spectrum. Seems like a good idea, right? Yeah, like, I, oh, I want as many colors as possible. Right. But it's really not optimal for printing. And currently, there really aren't any displays or anything that display pro photo. So Adobe RGB 1998, that is the color space. If you're working in that color space, you should be good. Did I say that? 1998. Yeah, it's like Adobe RGB 1998. <laughs> So now the question is about printing size and resolution and how big can I go? Can I print them as big as I want? Give me all the information, I, I need it. Yeah, what you're talking about when you're talking about DPI is the resolution of the image. So for example, you've got these Sony 24 megapixel cameras. Okay. A 24 megapixel camera is going to be able to print at 13.5 by 20 inches at 300 DPI. At 300 DPI. So if you're willing to print at 150 DPI, half of 300, you're gonna be able to print at twice the size. Twice the size. So then you'd be able to print at 27 by 40 at 150 DPI. Okay, why is dropping your DPI better than upsampling your image? You run the risk of Photoshop sort of misinterpreting a lot of those fine details and you'll sort of start to see pixelation. Personally, I would always prefer a little less sharp image that doesn't have you know noise and pixelation in it than something that's been interpolated. Got it. Upsampling. And in real world settings, like you're the print, <laughs> am I gonna notice a difference between a 150 DPI print and a 300 DPI print? Yes. Okay. I'd say if, if you're this far away, yeah. um, you're gonna notice. Um, if you are four feet away, uh, you probably won't notice. So Really? Even yourself, which is like a you're a print professional. Yeah. DPI is really about viewing distance. If you want somebody to be able to get right up to your print and see all those very fine details, you need to print at 300 DPI. Billboards are printed at like 10 or 20 DPI. Oh, really? Yeah. A couple hundred feet away where they're designed to be viewed from. They look sharp. They look awesome. Part of printing large is... If you're this close to the print, you can't see the whole right, print. Right, you don't even want to look at it that close anyway. Yeah, so if you're looking at a 4x6 print, you're talking about being 8 feet away. And at that distance, I mean, you could print at 100 dpi and probably not notice. Good to know. So if we need to make our prints a little bit larger, dropping the dpi is much better than increasing the resolution or upsampling the actual image. Correct. Got a lot of good nuggets so far. What's the deal with ICC profiles? I have no idea even what they are. Well, kind of, right? It's like the language that the printer speaks. Sort of, yeah. More of like a translator between two languages. Essentially a lookup table. It says, okay, whenever you see this color, make it this color. You can use ICCs for displays. You can use them for cameras. You can use them for printers. And that'll enable you to get the most accurate color, the best shadow detail, the, you know, widest color gamut. The thing about ICC profiles is they're very particular. So every printer is going to have a separate profile for every paper. What we do here is we make custom profiles Got it. for everything. So we calibrate every paper that we use for every printer that we use. That's crazy. I mean, this sounds just beyond me. So <laughs> it sounds like for you, this took a lot of work and time and research and figuring it out. I really like it. It's like my, my thing. So what does this actually look like? Where do you start? People sending in files for print you don't have to worry about ICC profiles. The only ICC that you're using is Adobe RGB 1998. That's an ICC? It is an ICC. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. 
your printing profile uh, is something that we have. That's something that you choose when you actually are in the you know file print dialog of Photoshop. Right. Ideally, you'd have a custom one made just for your printer. I and mean, you don't have to take your printer anywhere. Um, printing technicians are able to send you these files that are like these calibration files that you print out. You send them in to the print house and they'll scan them for you and email you an ICC profile. The ICC profiles that, you know, Hannah Mule or Canson or Epson provides are actually pretty bad for most printers. Okay. It's no wonder why we get a million questions about printing and it's no wonder why I've never been able to do printing. It's really complex. Like, there's a lot to it. It's I mean, it sounds legit hard. People dedicate their lives to it. <laughs> <laughs> so we got one more question. Super curious here. It's about paper. Is there a best paper? Can you kind of give us just a good general rundown on, on paper in general? Yeah. So, I mean, part of the art, the craft of printmaking is knowing what paper is going to work for which image. There is no best paper. There is no... Uh, perfect paper that works great for everything. There's some images that look great on glossy, just like a super metallic paper that's super smooth and flashy and, you know, some like fashion photography, product photography looks great on glossy. Some things like foggy landscape or something like that would look horrible on glossy. So like you have to choose a paper that enhances the subject that's in your image. So maybe for the foggy landscape, you do some, like a matte paper would look really nice. It's like, you know, soft, velvety. Likewise, maybe you'd have uh, some rich sunset landscape with super high contrast. That's not gonna look as good on matte, but glossy is a little, just gonna be too much glare and reflection on it. So for that sort of thing, I'd recommend like a Barita paper, which sort of looks like a traditional darkroom paper. It's all about knowing what paper is going to work for each image, you know? So at Print Lab, we've sort of narrowed down to our five or six basic categories and sort of chosen our favorite papers from each. So okay. we've got a textured mat, a smooth mat, you've got a Brita paper, glossy paper, a luster paper, and we've got canvas. Got it. Custom recommendations through our experience is like a big part of what we do. The framing, I know, is a big thing too. Um, obviously, you know, you've got regular glass, which has a bit of reflection. You've got museum glass, which still has a reflection, just less. What's your advice, like, when it comes to glass and, and print? Glassed prints are great for, you know, if you have it in a lobby or something where there's, you know, a lot of foot traffic. But if it's for exhibition um, or even just in your house, I really like to avoid glass at all costs. Especially one of the advantages of printing on matte is that you can look at it from any angle. Yeah. And there's not gonna be a reflection. It's a very like immersive print. Yeah, experience. these prints behind us, these are all from the Apollo 11 mission, right? They're all matte too. And yeah. they're, they're, I mean, brilliant. Yeah. yeah. And if you look at the, you know, there's not really like too much like dust or dirt or anything on them. Like the sort of unconventional display of having a print with no glass, being able to see the full texture of the paper and not having any glare at all is actually like really striking. Sandra, thanks so much, man. This has been awesome. I've learned a ton. Can we get like a little quick recap for everyone of like, here's the top points, here's the top takeaways. Yeah, sure. Make your monitor darker. Wouldn't necessarily worry about calibration. Always work in Adobe RGB 1998. Print at 300 DPI if you can. Feel free to drop your DPI a little bit. ICC profiles are really important to the printing workflow, but not really something you have to worry about. And finally, I guess paper choice. I'm always happy to recommend something, but you know, just think about the surface, experiment on different papers. It's a personal choice. There's no perfect paper. Nice. Well, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much to Print Lab in Chicago. You guys are fantastic. I've been blown away by every single print that I've gotten for you. Uh, if you want to check out Print Lab, click on the screen right up there. You can go right to the web page. You can send them a message. You want to say, I'll learn you later? I'll learn you later. I'll learn you later also. Bye everyone. <laughs>